was 11 years old when I sat in my grandmother's kitchen trying to learn how to sew. Looking back, I feel extremely lucky to have been able to spend that time with her, even if I was a bit nervous around the needle. My grandmother was a professional seamstress, and her father, my great-grandfather, was a professional tailor. It feels like I'm continuing to develop a skill that has been part of my family for generations, and I hope that I can learn some new sewing and tailoring techniques while I'm working on making my 1890s walking jacket. As you may remember from my previous videos about this particular jacket, I base this ensemble on a fashion plate from 1890, specifically the leftmost sketch. I also used a sewing pattern for this whole outfit from Angela Clayton, where she did an 1890s walking suit. In the previous videos, I've already completed multiple mock-ups, as well as created all the tailoring tools that I would need for making the final version of this jacket and cutting out all the pieces for both the outer layer and the inner lining. So now there's just some assembly required. After sewing together all the pieces for the back, it was time to apply the soutache braiding detail. In order to transfer the pattern onto the back of my jacket, I decided to use this dissolvable paper onto which I traced the pattern and then adhered it to the back panel. The instructions in the pattern were to one, use a continuous braid for the entire pattern, folding under edges where necessary, and sewing it on by hand. I attempted to do both. After realizing that I am far too slow in hand sewing the soutache braiding to the back of my jacket, I looked up other techniques of attaching the braid and I saw that it's entirely possible to do it by machine. You have to adjust the presser foot quite frequently, but I personally found that it was neater and faster in my case because I'm quite a slow hand sewer. Here you can see a comparison of the first soutache braid that I attached where on the left loop I sewed it by hand, and on the right, I did it by machine. They're slightly different, but I think the machine stitching actually looks a bit neater, so I continue to do that for the rest of the time. One thing I learned in this process is that in order to make the braid sit nice and flat when you're trying to do edges or corners, you can pull on one of the two internal threads that run through the soutache braiding in order to make one side shorter and have the braid naturally curve around the pattern you're trying to make. I unfortunately also struggled with keeping my braid looking neat. Every time I shortened one side to make the braid go around the corner more easily, I frayed the braid just slightly. As you can see here, I frayed this braid quite a bit because I kept on pulling on the wrong end of the braid, making the soutache braid turn the wrong way. At this point, I had already given up on hand sewing the soutache braid, as was mentioned in the pattern, but I also gave up on trying to make it out of one continuous piece of braid pretty early on. I didn't really understand what was meant by turning in at the corners where necessary necessary without making it look awful. So I ended up just doing many different sections of braids in order to follow the design as given. If anyone has any better instructions for how to do this properly, please do let me know because I would love to learn how to do this the right way. Once I was done hiding all of the ends of my braids, I cut away the excess dissolvable paper and made my piece ready to soak in water to dissolve it all off. I let it sit in a shallow pan of cool water for about half an hour, and at that point, after rinsing it off one last time, it was clear of all of that paper that I had previously used to transfer the pattern. I then took it out of the pan and it was time to dry it. I did want to dry it by squeezing it out in a towel, but my dog Nutella decided that that was hers. So I decided to hang it over a railing instead to let it fully dry. At this point, I sewed the back panel with a soutache braiding on it to the two front panels that I had previously assembled. As you can probably tell from my expression, I am less than pleased with how this has turned out. I spent so much time making, remaking, unpicking, re-sewing, making adjustments to my mock-ups that I thought that 
this final piece would come together much more smoothly. However, I still think that my shoulders are far too wide and really kind of droop down over the points of my shoulders, whereas the 1890s shoulders were quite narrow, even after I'd made so many narrow shoulder adjustments. I was also a bit concerned about how high the back piece was riding up on my neck, and I wasn't exactly sure if that's the way that it should fit. I also didn't really like the gaping that was happening at the back of my arm side, as well as some of the looseness that was happening in the bust area, though I was hoping that it would be fixed by adding some stiff interfacing to the lining. At this point, I knew that I would have to rework some of my jacket bodice construction and other details. So as I was pretty frustrated and demotivated, I decided to go back to a happy place of mine, which is my original antique 1890s delineator magazines. And looking through that, I just reminded myself really, how did the shoulders sit? How high up did the necklines of the jackets go? What am I expecting the sleeves to look like? Where do the puffs sit in the early 1890s? How flat does the collar sit? How much do the lapels curve over or up, and I had a really fun time looking at all the beautiful illustrations. I ended up finding two illustrations from my magazines that I think are pretty close to what I was hoping that the shoulder and collar and lapel area would look like, and I saw how high up the jacket rode on the back of the neck and how narrow the shoulders really were and where the lapels and the collar sat, making me much more comfortable in altering my jacket and making another narrow shoulder adjustment and leaving the neckline as is. Of course, in order to do this narrow shoulder adjustment, I first had to unpick my jacket body at each shoulder seam. After unpicking the shoulder seams and using the creases of where my arm was causing the fabric to fold over, I cut out the extra width of the jacket from the front panels. I used the bit of scrap that I cut off from one side as a template to know exactly how much and where to cut out from the other side. I only filmed me cutting out the front panel pieces because I was pretty nervous when doing the back panel sections of narrowing the shoulders since that was where I had just spent hours of my time attaching the soutache braiding, so I really didn't want to make a mistake. Hopefully you can tell by my expression that I'm a little bit happier with how this looks. I think that the shoulders sit slightly better. I'm trying to account a little bit visually for the seam allowance, so it is maybe still slightly wider than I would typically like it, but I was hoping that the seam allowance would take out a little bit more of the width of the shoulders. At this point, I haven't yet adjusted for the gaping that's happening at the back of the arm side and whatever is happening in the front of this jacket. So the next step that I'm going to do is actually adjust the arm size and make them narrower at the panel where they seem to be buckling outwards. Sadly, I didn't show the process of narrowing the back of the arm size. However, this is the finished look where I actually put it on over my corset and my chemisette just to kind of get the better underneath silhouette. And I think that the gaping at the back of the arm side is really improved. And overall, how the jacket sits in the front is a little bit better as well, just because I have some more volume to fill out the extra space that's in the front. I still think that there's going to need to be some adjustments done there though, because there's some strange puckering happening at the darts. But overall, I am pleased that this is actually looking better than the first time that I sewed everything together, and I don't think I messed anything up majorly by making these adjustments on my final jacket body. I then transferred all those alterations onto the lining pieces and sewed them together. Before attaching the lining to the inside of my jacket, I wanted to press all of the seams open, and this is where my tailor's ham came in really handy. So the tailor's ham I made in my last video really helped in all the curved seams that happen in the back of the jacket where it really gets fit and then flared towards the bottoms. Now, this next part is a little bit disappointing to actually rewatch because I spent the time to research pad stitching and purchase horsehair canvas to try to do some pad stitching on the lapel. However, as you can see here, as I'm thinking through it, in order to pad stitch the curve in the right direction, I'd have to have the lapel curve away from me, though the lapel is supposed to be sat as if it were curved towards me, but it's just not possible to do that. So the horsehair canvas would actually need to be applied to the other side of the jacket, which it can't be because of the way that that piece is constructed. So I don't think this pattern 
pattern is really set up to use pad stitching and tailor's canvas. At least I don't have the skills to know how to alter it at this point so that I could do some of those tailoring techniques that I was really hoping to do. So I had to be a little bit hacky, unfortunately, with the interfacing on the lapels. And you can see that in the final product, which is a little bit disappointing, but I did the best that I could do, I think, with what I had. On a positive note though, I got a lot of use out of the sleeve board that I made and I showed you guys how I made that in my last video as well. It was fantastic for ironing open the seams of the sleeves and making sure that everything was ironed flat without any creases. Unfortunately, the narrowest part of the sleeve was too narrow for the tip of the sleeve board, but this is where I luckily decided to make the sausage as well, the tailor sausage. That was just small enough to fit at the very tip end of my sleeve so that I could also iron those nice and crisply flat. After attaching the inner lining to the sleeves, I was able to then repress everything and just I had so much joy using a sleeve board that I had personally made myself. There was just extra pleasure out of using tools that I had made specifically for this purpose, although I'll hopefully get more use out of it for other sleeves as well. After a lot of sleeve pressing, I was finally ready to gather the tops of the sleeves. 1890s, at least early 1890s sleeves are very poofy right at the tip of the sleeve. And so I did the gathering stitches in long base stitches using actually upholstery thread. I learned my lesson when I had to do similar gathering on my skirt using the same fabric and I kept on breaking the thread that I was attempting to use to gather. So I'm using very, very sturdy thread here here in order to gather up the fabric and make a poof at the top of my sleeve. I'm pretty happy with how it looks. After setting, removing, resetting, removing, and resetting both sleeves multiple times, I finally decided to stop here with my left and right sleeves. Looking at it now, I can definitely see that there's some issues that I still haven't managed to figure out with setting sleeves. In the back, there seems to be extra fabric. In the front, I seem to have these strange diagonal creases across both sleeves. So if anyone has any idea on how I could improve how those look, please do let me know. I very much want to learn and I still have the ability to reset those sleeves and make them look better in the future. So I need your help. Please do let me know how I can remove those creases and maybe make it not look quite so bunched in the back. But at this point, I do have sleeves set into my jacket, which is a huge moment. <laughs> Of course, there are a few more soutache braid details missing from the front of my jacket, and these I decided to draw on with chalk by hand because there's horsehair canvas in here in these front panels that I did not want to get wet by using that dissolvable paper. So I marked it out by hand, and then I sewed all the braiding on with my sewing machine. If you watched how I made my 1890s walking skirt, you'll have seen these buttons before. This is a set of antique 1800s buttons that was taken off of another dress that was in too bad of a shape to repair or keep around. So these sets of buttons actually existed on an extant 1800s gown or maybe walking suit. In any case, I'm using them also to close up the front of my jacket. Now, technically the last step of the pattern is to sew the lining of the jacket to the outer layer of the jacket. I used long basting stitches to baste the hem of the inner lining and separately the outer layer of the jacket and then hand sewed both of those together. It would have been faster to do this by machine, especially for me because like I said before, I'm a very slow hand sewer, but I really didn't want the hem stitches to stick out on the right side of the jacket. So I took the time to do this by hand and I actually think that my stitches improved quite a bit by the time I was done hemming this jacket. 
Now I did say that hemming the jacket was technically the last step of the pattern. However, there's one step that I skipped while I was creating the jacket, and that was to add a lace detail to the bottom of the cuffs of each sleeve. And when I saw that, I just knew that I had to hand knit myself some lace. I decided to use the exact same pattern that I used for my chemisette at the neck so that when I wore this jacket, the lace at the top of my neck and at the bottom of my sleeves would match. As usual, after I was finished knitting both lengths of lace that I needed for my cuffs, I starched them, this time using a homemade mixture from tapioca starch, and made sure to pin it out very open and as straight as possible along the bottom edge, where I would be sewing it to the sleeve. And there you have it, the last piece of my 1890s walking ensemble. And I am very much enjoying wearing it and taking it for a nice long walk. I spent a long time working on this jacket and this jacket became a bit of a procrastination piece for me because it was quite intimidating for me to do such exact sewing when I really don't feel like I have the skills to do so. And when I look at it, I can definitely see a lot of areas where I could improve, but I'm also incredibly proud because it is a piece that shows that no matter how difficult something might be or where my skills are at a certain time, as long as you persist and you try and you ask for help, you can get to a result that feels really good to wear. And I do feel really proud wearing this. I do have to say thank you so much to everyone who's watched and commented on my videos when I was trying to make this because you given me such amazing and helpful feedback that has, while maybe the jacket isn't exactly perfect, it is so much better than if it weren't for everyone who's given me the fantastic advice. So thank you very, very much for all of the help. I also want to say that all of the kind comments have been really, really helpful as well for me as I am on this sewing journey because I am very new to sewing and I can be a little bit hard on myself. Something else that I, I hope that anyone else who's watching can take away is you don't have to be a perfect sewer to put something together that you can be happy wearing. With time and trial and error and some effort, you can maybe hopefully also make an outfit, an ensemble, or a dress that you really love wearing. So I just want to say thank you again for all of the advice and while I'm actually not quite finished yet with my ensemble so I have a few more hand knit items that I want to finish before actually calling this complete because this is technically a winter ensemble so I need some accessories if I'm going to be going out in the cold. So if you enjoyed watching this video then feel free to stick around because next time I will be knitting a cape to go on top of this jacket. Thank you so much. I'll hopefully see you then.